Good evening, everyone. I'm Brent Christopher. I'm the President and Chief Executive Officer at Communities Foundation of Texas. CFT is a public foundation that is headquartered here in Dallas. We manage charitable dollars from thousands of donors, and we work with those donors. We work with nonprofits, with other foundations, and with civic leaders and media organizations to strengthen the quality of life in many different ways across North Texas and beyond. One important part of what we do is focused on building financial stability for low-income working families. A couple of years ago, we asked the Corporation for Enterprise Development to come and take a look at Dallas and help us to get an accurate picture of our financial health. The snapshot that CFED took was a wake-up call. Across North Texas, almost 30% of us don't have a safety net of assets beneath us to keep us above the poverty line for more than three months if we're hit with a major event like the loss of a job or a terrible illness. In Dallas proper, that number rises to almost 40%, and it describes the reality in neighborhoods all over our city. The implications of that for people across North Texas are huge. Those implications relate to education, to jobs, to health, how we understand the financial tools that are available to us, our economic competitiveness as a region, the dynamics in our families, and ultimately, to the quality of life for everyone in this place that we call home. That's why we're having this gathering tonight. Last year, some of us at CFT sat down with our friends at KERA to see if they would be interested in showing a documentary produced in another city about this topic. And they shook their heads and said, no. Well, that was a little disappointing, actually, at first. But, <laughs> but they quickly came back and said, why don't we create our own documentary that features real families right here in North Texas? What if we can more broadly participate in our own community-wide conversation? And that gave birth to one crisis away. We are so grateful to KERA for eagerly rolling up their sleeves to help our region better understand the realities of life for a huge number of local households and to help us all figure out what will make a difference in building financial security. In addition to KERA, there are several folks that we need to thank tonight. Of course, uh, first and foremost, the stellar panel for this evening, including Andrea LeVere from the Corporation for Enterprise Development in Washington, Alfreda Norman from the Federal Reserve Bank right here in Dallas, and our own Larry James at City Square, and of course, the always fantastic Chris Boyd with KERA. The funding partners tonight, alongside Communities Foundation of Texas, who are making this event possible, are the Allstate Foundation, the Dallas Women's Foundation, the Fort Worth Foundation, the Thompson Family Foundation, and United Way of Metropolitan Dallas. Most importantly, we need to thank the people that you will meet tonight through video, who have very bravely told their personal stories so that each of us can see and feel firsthand what it really means to be one crisis away. As a particular treat tonight, I'm proud to tell you actually that the families are not only with us on video, but they're actually here live and in person. Join me now in welcoming the families who will be featured in tonight's event. And now it's my pleasure to ask you again to join me in warmly welcoming the President and CEO at KERA, Marianne Alhadoff. Welcome, everyone. Our sincere thanks to Brent Christopher and the Communities Foundation of Texas for bringing to KERA's attention the research about the hundreds of thousands of North Texans who do not have sufficient assets to live for three months at the federal poverty level if they faced a financial crisis. 
The statistics for North Texas documented in the research from the Corporation for Enterprise Development are truly alarming. But the One Crisis Away series is doing more than simply reporting the numbers. From the beginning, it has been about the experiences and day-to-day -day situations of people who are living on the financial edge because of lost wages, health care costs, and other reasons that could affect any one of us at any time. The series is also about identifying ways to help. Many of you have been following the One Crisis Away series since it began last November on KERA. Three families and one individual from the communities of DeSoto, Louisville, Rockwall, and White Settlement have bravely shared their stories. Tonight, through video, we'll learn about their experiences and circumstances. KERA extends our heartfelt appreciation to all of them. The One Crisis Away series has received considerable response from others who are also in financial crisis. I'd like to share one communication with you that came to our wonderful reporter, Courtney Collins, who has reported this series. It went like this. Dear Miss Collins, I happened to catch your piece about One Crisis Away on the radio. As I listened to it, my eyes got wider and wider, and I found myself nodding my head. We are one of those families. We are in that crisis. I'm a 12-year Army veteran with several overseas tours, two of which were in Iraq. My wife is a degreed and very capable RN. I've been unemployed, desperately seeking work be since before I returned home from my last overseas tour. We are trying our hardest. Why is it so hard to make ends meet? We are trying so hard. KERA has been fortunate to be working with a number of organizations who provide information and help to those in financial crisis. The ability to point those in need to these resources has been a very important part of One Crisis Away, and we sincerely thank these agencies and organizations for their involvement in the work they do. Tonight's forum is being moderated by KERA's Chris Boyd, who, as you all know, is host and managing editor of Think. The program is being taped for a one-hour television program that, will, special, that will, air, will air on KERA on March 27th at 7 p.m. Following the forum, we invite you to a reception in the lobby to meet the panelists and continue the conversation. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening. twenties with the home, sun on the way. We were, you know, flying high. So the last thing I would have thought about was, oh, I'm get sick. It's hard to say. You save it today, you spend it today. I don't have any security. So basically I live paycheck to paycheck. We had to start using credit cards again because that couple weeks I was off work. It's hard because before we're two incomes and now it's just me and you know we get social security but it's not much. It's a very hard choice. Do I put a roof over my head or do I have insurance and go to a shelter? The first thing I kept thinking is, I'm a statistic. I'm a single black woman, children out of wedlock, and my future is gonna be very bleak. I know times are hard, but my saying is, tough times don't last always, but good people do. I'm Chris Boyd. One in three North Texans can't weather a financial storm that lasts 90 days. The problem is known as asset poverty, and it doesn't discriminate. A job loss, a health emergency, even legal trouble is enough to plunge a third of our friends and neighbors into financial distress. And a recent report from the Corporation for Enterprise Development brought even more concerning news that half of Texas households overall live in a state of persistent financial insecurity, meaning that any interruption in that regular income or any expensive family emergency could push them below the poverty line. Since last November, KERA has been reporting on this issue through radio features, online reports, videos, and in-depth conversations on Think as part of the One Crisis Away initiative. We've also been following four families on the financial edge, and you will meet all four of them during this program. 
We have a great panel of distinguished guests here at the Dallas City Performance Hall to discuss the factors that lead to asset poverty and potential solutions to the problem. Please help me welcome Alfreda Norman, Vice President and Community Development Officer at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Thank you. Thank you, and we have Larry James, President and CEO of City Square. And Andrea Levere, President of the Corporation for Enterprise Development. Welcome all of you. We would like to invite you to join the discussion with questions and comments on Twitter. Tweet at KERA News using the hashtag OneCrisisAway. Let's start with you, Alfreda. What is asset poverty and how is it different from income poverty? Well, I think you all have heard uh, how we're defining asset poverty. So if you have three months of savings at the poverty level to cover you in case there's any kind of interruption of your employment or something happens, that you have three months of savings. So to give you an example of that, if you are a single parent with one child and you, um, the poverty threshold is about $15,000. So that would be about $3,800 that you would need to have that you could get to, uh, whether in cash or in other some investments or some sort, so that you could get to that. So that's how we define asset. Um, having, you know, if, you've, if you're at that level that you do not have three months of savings at that level, you're at asset poverty. So a lot of people think that income, of course, determines your wealth. Right? So, but really the best measure of one's wealth is their net worth. And so what is net worth? It's all your assets, all that you own, minus your li liabilities, all that you owe, equals your net worth. And it's so important, as you can see, assets play an important part of that. If you come into problems in life, which occurs, flat tires, illness, all kinds of things, it's the buffer against kind of those things, going off the cliff, the financial cliff. So it's really important to have savings. So when you look at asset poverty, it really is much larger than you would think. It's not, oftentimes we think of poverty as, you know, maybe somebody kind of down and out in their luck under the bridge waiting with a sign, but it really is not. It's, it's so many people in our community. It could be the kindergarten teacher or the person in the nail shop or someone that you work with all the time. So it's something that we wanted to have a conversation about, and we're just we're happy to have the community conversation over these week, past weeks to really talk about this. Andrea, how common, how widespread is asset poverty throughout Texas? So the statistics, as uh, you shared just a few minutes ago, Chris, is that for the whole state of Texas, 50% of Texan households live in liquid asset poverty. And we use this measure, as Alfreda talked about, because if something happens, you can't just sell your car that day. You can't sell your house and get the equity out. So what are the real liquid resources that you can use to address those problems? That's a stunning number. But at the same time, it challenges your preconceptions in a somewhat scary way it also changes the conversation. Because what we've discovered for the last two years we have been using this metric is that suddenly it's not just about those poor people, it's about half of us. And so it's a much more productive discussion to say, how do people all around my neighborhood, people who I see every day, as Alfreda said a few minutes ago, how do we think about solutions together because it's not a hidden problem. And the key issue around living in a state of financial insecurity is that it changes the way you look at the future. And it changes the way you plan for the future. And if we think about what makes a healthy community and a growing economy, it's all about thinking ahead. Larry, we have talked about job loss as a risk factor, and obviously it's a major life crisis, but there are plenty of people in asset poverty who are employed full-time. Absolutely. Uh, as a matter of fact, 59% uh, of the households in Dallas have all the parents working. Um, and so you can be employed and be underemployed or have a, an event, a crisis, that 
basically cast you into deeper poverty, income poverty, not just asset poverty. Uh, we worked with over 55,000 different people last year at City Square. The vast majority were poorer even than the asset poverty description. And they came to us for all kinds of basic things because when crisis came to their lives, their circumstances were not nearly as forgiving as some of our circumstances would be. Uh, and so we kind of see the other side of the cliff, if you will. Once the crisis comes and you fall into asset poverty, if there's not some intervention or remedy, then the spiral will be downward into income poverty. And in some cases here in Dallas, uh, severe income poverty. Andrea, we have talked about obviously financial assets, but there are other less tangible things that, be, that can count for us or against us. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we focus a lot on um, is how we build savings, because that's your personal safety net. And then what are the use to which we put our savings? And in many ways, we've always thought home ownership was how you live the American dream. But I think the changes in the economy and what's happened over the last five years have really, really reinforced that building human capital is a critical piece. And so we think about the issue of education, access to education, and financing that education, which has become even more challenging. And how can we do that, not just relying on debt, but also thinking about saving very early, which has led to one of the uh, biggest growth areas in our work, which is setting up children's savings accounts when kids are as young as kindergartners. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things we also know is that the habits you learn early, whether they're good or bad, can be very enduring. And so how come we can't start right from the start? The Community Enrichment Center is a faith-based nonprofit serving Tarrant County families in crisis. It introduced us to the Dory family, and Courtney Collins shares their story. Shanique and J.C. Dory are raising her two children in the Fort Worth suburb of White Settlement. They both work full-time as a teacher and truck driver and are very active at church. They budget carefully, coupon, and sometimes say no to purchases they describe as more wants than needs. And like a lot of families, they're working to chip away at credit card debt and worry a lot about the what ifs. It's our faith in God that gets us through a lot of rough patches and where we would feel discouraged or depressed. I think that it's our faith and our ability to pray with one another and pray for one another that keeps us grounded. You have to believe in something bigger than yourself. It seems like I could never get caught up till I start paying my tithes. And I was thinking that I can't get caught up. How am I gonna pay my tithes? When I put it in faith's hands, in God's hands, and started paying my tithes, it seemed like the money started, you know, coming back to me anyway. We just got some credit cards paid off, all the credit cards paid off, and uh, we had to start using credit cards again because that couple weeks I was off work. So now we got the credit card debt back, but we're getting it knocked back down slowly. Hallelujah, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against what you're doing. Without my husband, of course, being the man that he is, the man of God, and leading our family, and without having, you know, the pastors that we have here, the ministry leaders that we have here, it's, it's no way to keep going. You know, you get boggled down with work stuff, with the stresses and strains of life, and this is just something to encourage you to keep you going. Life in America, that's the way most of us are, the majority. I agree, and I think that, you know, we're no different because if something was to happen with his job, we, we would have a very difficult time and vice versa. I think that would put our family in a very, very difficult position. It basically lists all of our expenses every month, our um, medical bills, household bills, mortgage, anything that we have to go out monthly is on my spreadsheet. For new Sam's Club or no? Mm -hmm. When was the last time you used it? I think when I got something for the kids' PTA. The first thing I kept thinking is, I'm a statistic. I'm a single parent, single black woman, children out of wedlock, and 
my future is going to be very bleak. The Community Enrichment Center did a lot um, to help me and the children. They first started off by putting me and the children in a three-bedroom house, two-car garage. And that was great because it gave us, you know, a stable place to live. I was raised by a single uh, mother, so she had to do what she had to do. She had two jobs and still the bills were paid late every now and then. We didn't have a car for a long time. I know that homelessness, I never want that to be an option for me or the children ever again. So it does, I won't say it's out of fear, but it's out of protecting my investments, protecting my assets. You know, we were poor growing up, so I wanted to do something different on my way up. We have to pay on scholarship. Yes. Have some car repairs. Look, this is paid off. Part of growing up these days. You had them uh, running out the house blowing money as soon as they get up out of here. That would be a terrible thing, because then I have to pick them back up. Let's go ahead and teach them now. That way they don't run right outside off the porch and fall. I think that it's me being a young, responsible adult. If I didn't learn all the cleaning and all the chores and the discipline now, when I grow up and my mom's not there to walk me through every step, I'd be lost. Larry, the Dories are a great reminder that moms and dads try to protect their kids from everything they can. They try to get them ready to be out in the real world. But they also remind us that children are aware when families are struggling, and they're part of the struggle. Right. Uh, asset poverty and the anxiety that comes along with that decline affects children. Uh, income poverty, we have seen, really affects children. and. Uh, we've learned at City Square that if a child has hope, uh, they tend to have reason to read at grade, le uh, grade level. If they don't have hope, all kinds of other things begin to happen, including not being able to read at grade level. And so um, this really is a holistic matter, and income is a huge part of how a family is able to live. Income has a lot to do with how families are shaped. I would say, however, that young woman we just heard uh, from is incredibly responsible, and uh, I could have used her several years ago to teach me how to be a better dad uh, in terms of personal responsibility. And that brings up the subject of personal responsibility. A lot of people feel like that these problems are the result of people not being responsible. And I've learned over the past 20 years that's just not true. Um, I, I tell people all the time that uh, laziness and lack of initiative and irresponsibility is spread at the same depth across the entire socioeconomic continuum. And so you can't explain our problems in those terms. Uh, you've got to understand that we have a systemic problem that is pervasive. And so uh, hearing that young woman speak in such a responsible and grown up way is really not surprising to me. But if opportunity does not continue to roll out for her and her family, uh, then she'll face some challenges that are going to be really unfair in light of her effort and her heart. Alfreda, 65% of Texas families have subprime credit scores. What goes into those scores and how they're calculated and what effect do they ultimately have on household budgets? Well, a credit score is just, in these days and times, it's just essential to first of all, understand what it is. And just as you go to the doctor when you're going to be diagnosed for your health, you have some very basic numbers that you need to know, your blood pressure, your BMI, et cetera, cholesterol. If you're going to be managing your finances, you need to know about your credit score. Now, what is the credit score made of? Well, it's a complicated algorithm in a box, black box, that's really kind of hard to even know exactly. But there are some things that you need to know what to do. And Basically what a credit score is, it's just showing how you manage credit. So if I'm going to extend credit to you as a lender, I need to know if you're going to pay me back. And so I come up with all of these algorithms and mathematical things, probability, that lets me know whether or not you're going to pay me back. So if you pay your bills on time on a consistent manner, you're going to be in good shape and you'll have a pretty good credit score. If you're late, if you are constantly late, or if you have big gaps in payments, then it won't be. So the credit score determines your cost of credit. 
And so if you have good credit, then a lender is going to say, huh, I'm going to get my money back pretty well, and I'm going to offer you your credit at this rate. If your credit score is not so good, then your cost of credit is going to be more, and the lender is going to say, hmm, I'll give you this credit, but I'm going to charge you a little bit more because I'm not sure you're going to pay me back, and it might cost me a little bit to get my money back. So this is the, the credit score is the score and the game that we're playing called you know, managing finances. And so you need to know what you need to do in order to maintain it and keep it because it affects not just when you borrow money, but it might affect the cost of your insurance. It might affect whether or not you get an apartment. It might affect whether an employer will, will hire you. It's your demonstration of how you manage your credit. So it's, it's a really important thing that everybody knows how to do this. There's great resources so that you can get your own free credit score and look at it. And there are things that you can do to maintain it, which is really, really important. Andrea, 37% of households in Texas do not have a savings account, and a third of those have no bank account whatsoever. What keeps people from engaging with the banking system, and what happens to them when they don't have access to this? So I'll start by just building off what Alfreda just said. If your credit score is really the password into the economy, which it is today, a bank account is the first tool that you can use that can help you work within that economy. And so there's multiple reasons. There's no one reason why people don't have accounts, but I will also say that the state of Texas, when we compare people who are completely unbanked and then people who are underbanked, terrible word, but what it means is that they have some kind of formal account, but they use alternative providers, payday lenders, check cashers, rent to own, and is 40% of the state which is the second worst number in the United States. So one of the issues around here is what it costs to be unbanked. On average, a person who is completely unbanked spends $1,000 a year on financial services. I spend nothing. So suddenly you think, yet another reason, back to what Larry was saying, of the high cost of being poor. So there's a huge movement around the country to really create um, marketing and collaborative arrangements with financial institutions to create accessible, fairly priced accounts that make people feel like they're a part of the system and help them build that basic structure. Because as you said, Chris, if you don't even have a savings account, how are you gonna be begin to save? And then how do you use all these wonderful benefits we have from technology, such as direct deposit, so you don't even have to think about saving, it's done for you. Because you know if that happens, it'll happen much more often. Larry, how do people get caught in the cycle of payday loans, and why is it so hard to pull up out of that? Um, it, it, that's a really good question, and it's a very important one. Um, I spoke recently with a university professor who told me that due to a snag in the computer payroll technology of his university, he missed a paycheck and didn't receive it for 30 days. He told me that he went to a payday lender to borrow on a short-term basis to go to the grocery store. And he said, we're usually on the other side of that question because it's so unfair but what's the alternative in a crisis? Um, do you settle for four or 500% effective interest or do you feed your family? And you know that was the dilemma he faced. And he said, while we strike out at payday lenders, there are few alternatives in our communities for people in a crisis. Uh, we've worked hard at City Square to see uh, regulatory change regarding payday lenders. And the Dallas City Council has passed two ordinances that are model ordinances that have been adopted by other communities. Unfortunately, the legislature this last session kind of gutted our ability to really apply that legislation to those ordinances. We'll come back. And so we've got the reform of the payday lending industry, but we've got to come up with alternatives that make sense to bankers and to consumers because access to credit is a huge, or the lack of access to credit is a huge problem uh, especially among working poor families. 
Alfreda, are there alternatives to payday lending for families that might need a little extra help and could pay at a more competitive interest rate? Well, there's not, there, there are more and more, and if you look um, in your community to see the, the lenders that you have, there are more and more what we call small dollar loans that you can, can, can get at a, at a reasonable price. You know, most people use their credit cards. If you think about it, if you, if you run into a short-term snag, you'll just pull out your credit card and use your credit card. So the, the, the notion of people needing short-term amounts of money it, is not unreasonable. I mean, it happens really to everybody. So more and more, while ordinance would be good and to try to, to control it, what's happening is there is a demand for this. And so what, what's needed is competition in the sense of good products. So we're seeing that some, that's coming down the pike, not necessarily even from banks these days, but maybe from some in, initial kind of creative social entrepreneurs that are coming up with solutions in order to find the right sort of model, business model, in which to do this. Uh, and Andrea, I know that you know a little bit about this, that this notion of having innovation in products and services. Um, it, it's not impossible, it's just a matter of getting all the right pieces. For large banks, it's difficult sometimes to do small loans um, for them um, because of the, you know, they're small and it, it's expensive to, to, to administer them, but it's such a great need. So the industry is really trying to look at ways in which to come up with responsible small dollar loan products that people can, can get. And there's a nice pilot in Texas that's running right now that's happening in South Texas uh, that's coming to Dallas in the near future where it's a small dollar loan product in the employers. So it, the employer actually offers this to their employees and it's all, the back office is done by a nonprofit that does this. And then the, the loan is given and a person has about 12 months to pay it back, a reasonable amount to pay it back. And it's an easy thing for the employer. It's a great service to give because when employees are struggling financially, it's very difficult. So it's kind of innovation like that that's going to catch on. It's happening across the state. There's a lot of hard work to, to offer these things. And employers are a really good place to offer these small dollar loans. Andrea, can you tell us about the earned income tax credit and what this might do for families who are dealing with asset poverty? So I think Larry raised the point that there are different levels of poverty within the spectrum of people that he sees. And um, one of the things we've learned in this field over the last 20 years is you won't be successful unless you meet people where they are. And so um, we look at the question of building financial security as really a question that involves income, savings, investments, protections, and learning all together. Probably the single most effective anti-poverty policy mm -hmm. in the United States today is the earned income tax credit. And that tax credit goes to working families who, in fact, despite working full-time jobs, don't have a living wage and can't really afford basic necessities that are necessary. It has moved people, untold people, out of poverty um, in Texas, a wonderful collaboration called Opportunity Texas focuses in at tax time to really help people not just get the earned income tax credit, but also, because it's often the largest amount of money they'll see all year, save a piece of it, because then that helps address some of the problems that Larry was addressing before. There is a trend around the country for states to enact earned income tax credits that really parallel the federal tax credit. One of the goals would be that Texas would do the same because while there is strong job creation, as you know in this state, way too many of those jobs do not pay living wages. And as a result, you can't get by just with what you earn. The Shared Housing Center offers housing options and other supportive services for those in need. Natalie Burquist relied on shared housing after she briefly lost her job in 2012. Here's Courtney Collins with her story. Natalie Burquist knows what it means to be one crisis away, but she also knows what it feels like to fall over the edge. Natalie and her four-year-old son Samuel spent some time in transitional housing after a brief layoff in 2012. When we first met them, they'd moved into a Louisville apartment. Then, just last month, 
Natalie had to let that apartment go and move in with her brother after an unexpected new monthly bill arrived. We have a washer and dryer in here. And that's nice because I don't like going to the washeteria. It's like a lot with Samuel. And then we have one bedroom. This is Samuel's bedroom. So basically um, it's just a bed and then we have a little TV for Samuel. We don't have a table so Samuel gets to eat right there. So all of a sudden wait, everybody goes to this meeting and it's like the whole company, the president stands up or the company stands up and says, oh, we're letting you guys go. You're gonna get a 30 day written letter uh, of notice and uh, th the December 31st is your termination date and thank you for your employment here and don't ask for a severance. I ended up, you know, going staying in a hotel and then I ended up going to a shelter and um, it's called shared housing. I felt like somebody punched my stomach. Just the feeling of that it's not my fault, you know, but it was like I was blaming me because I felt like I let my family down. So it was very, very tough. Sing it. So basically I live paycheck to paycheck. I'm working on having a savings account. If I did lose my job or if there was something, um, you know, I'm working on having a cushion basically to have like, if something like that happened, I, I wouldn't be back in a shelter. I could still pay my bills for a month or two. I did go ahead and purchase the insurance for my job. What I thought was $200 a month out of my paycheck um, is initially $400. And because of that, I'm not able to continue staying in my apartment and re-sign my lease. So I am going to have to move out. It's such a sickening feeling to know that it's kind of like everything that I had worked for and, you know, got to this point is just it seems like it's gone down the drain. At least my brother, uh, who lives in Dallas, he bought a home. He's um, offering us to um, stay there and um, pay rent for the room. So that's good. It doesn't work out, you know. You need help. Those people like myself who are working don't get it. I'm working, I'm productive, you know, I'm paying taxes. I'm doing everything I'm supposed to, but still there is zero help. So I will be making some savings, and that's, you know, always been my ultimate goal. So we'll really see at the end of a year, has Natalie done what she said she was going to do? You have to hope, you know, you have to dream, you have to know and believe that there is going to be something better and reach for it. Because if you don't have any dreams and hopes, you know, and you don't reach for something else, you're going to be staying in the same spot. You don't, you don't want to do that. Larry, when we think about people struggling with homelessness, we don't picture somebody who looks like Natalie or her son for that matter, and yet housing has been a real challenge for them. Absolutely, and uh, there are so many folks who fall into that category of what I would call the invisible homeless, uh, who have to move in with a relative for a short period of time or who just kind of sofa hop uh, with friends or just make do without being on the street. Um, it's a, it's a real issue that we don't often recognize because, like I say, it is uh, unseen. Uh, but still, nevertheless, it creates family instability, doesn't work well with uh, uh, keeping a job. One of the things we face in the inner city of Dallas are move-in specials. And if you move into an apartment, you'll get a, rent, a month of rent free or maybe two months free. And this encourages families to move about the community and kids are taken out of one school and put into another school because of the benefit of finding a new apartment. Um, those are the realities of uh, low income, uh, even working people. And uh, it, it's a severe problem. Well, Alfreda, we've seen Natalie has a job in this segment. Um, she's still struggling. Um, can you talk a little bit about the poverty line, which is something that has come up several times tonight, the difference between the federal poverty line and what it actually takes to get by in a place like North Texas? Well, an example of, uh, mentioned before, looking at one's budget. So if you're a single parent and you have a child, as I mentioned before, the poverty level or threshold is $15,000. So 
but the example that, we're, that we've learned, and, or what we know, um, is that you need about $21,000 to really make it, to make ends meet, and that's on a very bare bones uh, budget. So the poverty level is a kind of a, it's, it's a number that, was, that came up in 1963. It's a measurement of what families spend. It actually was on food um, back in the 60s. Uh, and that, that poverty threshold continues to just be a measurement now. Um, so it doesn't really, when you hear what the poverty level is, you have to kind of do multiples of that. So $21,000 is what you need. The poverty level is 15000 So you're living at two times the poverty rate, but you're still struggling a bit. So it's a, it gets complicated when you, when you start thinking about all these things. And then there's things called relative poverty, right? So you might be making a pretty decent salary, but we live in a society in which you see things everywhere. And so you have relative poverty because you don't have, you know, two cars instead of one, and you don't have um, all of the luxury things that you see on TV all the time, um, and the things that are advertised. So there's this notion of relative poverty too. So it's it's all very complicated, um, and and really we're all kind of struggling to to figure out how to really f to define it. So there's a wonderful organization in Texas called the Center for Public policy priorities, we call it CPPP, and they really take a deep dive to figure out exactly what it needs, what a family of uh, one parent, two children, uh, two parents, two children, what it actually takes to, to, to make those ends meet. It's very helpful data because you really have to sit down and just do crunch all the numbers to see what it, what it takes because these numbers are, you know, become confusing um, and the relativity becomes confusing. So. Um, so this is a really good place to start. It's, it's a great resource and it really helps people to, for instance, Larry, I know it helps those of you that are on the front line that, are, that really need to know what are the numbers, what does it really take to make it in the Dallas, Fort Worth, North Texas area to make ends meet. Andrea, why are the risks so particularly high for single parent families? Well, as you know, Wages have stagnated in this country anywhere from the last 20 to 35 years. It's become, a f fueled a huge debate, right, about who gets the benefits, about the growing income and wealth inequality. And um, the economists go back and say that the only way families held it together in the 70s, 80s, and into the early 90s was when women went to work. And so rather than increasing wages, you just had two wage earners. So now you have mm -hmm. single parent households and you have an economy that is paying wages that assume you now have a two earner household, as we saw, for example, or we will see in another one of the series. So that brings, I think, a critical issue of how we deliver services and how we provide financial planning tools I know in this community there's yet another wonderful organization, the YWCA of Metropolitan Dallas, that is um, opening a new women's center this year with a model of comprehensive service delivery. And this is what we really see as the trend nationally. We are hosting a major conference in September and our theme is Platforms for Prosperity because no one thing can answer it. So how do you take a household and decide What's the role of housing in providing financial stability? What's the role of job training in perhaps increasing the wages that someone can earn? What's the role of financial counseling in building savings dollar by dollar? And what's the role of other financial tools that can really create greater financial stability within a household over time? So I think it takes a different service delivery, which is also gonna take changing the way we fund services so there's not so categorical but they really look at a much more holistic picture of what it takes to be financially secure. Of course, it is challenging when an earner is, um, incurs medical bills or has to pay medical bills, but sometimes someone suffers an illness that means that he or she can't work and can't provide the support they have been. Um, can you talk a little bit about the toll, Larry, that you've seen medical debt and medical expenses taking on families? Well, <clears throat> maybe, my colleagues can answer that better for the asset poverty group, but the folks at a lower level, uh, access to health care in a timely fashion, both for adults and children, is a major issue. 
uh, in the state and I think in our community here in Dallas. It certainly is a major issue in those parts of the city where people are actually living at half the federal poverty level. And so getting uh, consistent access to health care outside the emergency room, actually having a medical home that you can count on uh, it is, is a huge part of what it means to have healthy, well communities. Um, I know it's the same up, up the economic ladder, uh, but the imposition of a health crisis can literally destroy a family, both at the very bottom and further up. Um, can we talk about the rate of uninsurance in Texas or the, the insurance rate? I know this is something, um, Andrea, that you've been very interested in um, and you've done a lot of work on. So this year's Assets and Opportunity Scorecard, which you've cited, um, also shows very stunning statistics in Texas in terms of lack of access to health insurance. And we know that this is absolutely critical, and obviously there's a huge debate going on now in the country, um, because medical costs are the single largest cause of bankruptcy. You go through bankruptcy, Alfreda, what happens to your credit score? <laughs> Your credit score goes down, mm -hmm. your cost of borrowing goes up, and it gets cycle and cycle again. So the state of Texas ranks 47, 48, and 50 on health insurance coverages for low-income children, low-income parents, and then for the whole state in general. And if we think about what causes financial security, it's not just what you earn, it's not just what you save, but it's also how you protect what you have. And health insurance is key to that. I mean, I'll speak very personally. 15 years ago, I had a very rare form of cancer. And it was very unclear what was gonna happen. I had outstanding health insurance, wonderful health care. I was out of work for three weeks, and I haven't been sick a day since. Without that insurance, I would still be paying. Hmm. So it's just a very, very different kind of uh, reality that I had than most other people in this country do. Yeah. I'd like to add to that. You know, for most of us in Texas, uh, we ha we're very fortunate to have employer-based insurance, very good insurance, and for many people um, have enjoyed that benefit for quite some time. And what we have to begin to realize and think about is sort of th this notion of that we're all in this together, so you might be doing fine with your health insurance, but if large portions of the community is not insured, that's going to affect you in some way, in some way, in many ways. It, it affects, um, you know, there is a cost to helping people if they don't have the insurance that you're eventually going to pay. There's the cost of, uh, of so many things. So we have to begin to think kind of in a bigger way in that thinking holistically about our community, and I think that's the importance of the conversation, is that everybody along the spectrum if there's perspective about where everybody is, and to, and to keep that openness to think about that, and to know that just because perhaps I have mine, um, what about you getting yours, and, and how, can I, how can we help you? Because I think in the end, it makes the entire community stronger. It really, in the end, makes our economy stronger. And it's something that we should be thinking about, thinking in the community sense, that if, if everybody is doing well, then we all will do well. Retirement is supposed to be the time where you sit back and retire, but then we met Shirley Martin. Courtney introduces us to Shirley. To keep her head above water financially, 72-year-old Shirley Martin has to be creative. She's retired from her 30-year career as a professional cook, but Social Security isn't enough. So she works a part-time job, and rents rooms in her DeSoto home so she can pay her mortgage and take care of her bills. Saving money, she says, impossible. Okay, this can move. I'm doing the fresh baby carrots season with some chicken broth. I'll steam them for a minute. Cooking has always been my thing. Doing parties and luncheons and, I mean, I, I just can't say enough about it. I just started on my own. I um, started at Hockaday School in 63, 
and I started out as a line server. So it came up that we needed a, a cook. So I wanted to tackle anything. I said, well, I want to take that head cook's position. I did. I've had a hard time. I've been in foreclosures, you know, and I've lost a lot and I gained a lot. If they weren't here, I wouldn't be able to make it. I mean, that's just simple as that. Yeah, it helps out a lot. It really does, you know, because with my income and what I do, I make it up, you know, make it up barely, but it's still hard. It is really hard. A lot of people ask me, how do you take strangers in your home? Well, I just have that faith and I know they need the help and I just don't think about it. When I was a little girl, my mother used to take a red wagon and go around in the neighborhood and take up canned goods and stuff for whoever was not as fortunate as we were. And that's the same feeling I have today when I take people in from charity housing or anywhere, you know, I, I feel that same way. I just think that if I could do it, I would. It's good, I like it. I love it, really. Good afternoon, Salvation Army. Surely speaking, I can help you. It means a lot. That lets me know that I'm not doing as bad as I think I am, I could be, because I see all kind of people here. I, I, I hear them on the phone, and uh, I listen to them, and the stories, you know, and it means a lot to me. I just wish I could do more. It helps me with uh, my bills my insurance, and things that I come short of with my Social Security, and food, of course, and gas. And it just helps me in so many different ways, it does. Good afternoon, Salvation Army, Shirley speaking. It isn't hard to relate to them, because I've been there in a different fashion. But when you're down, you're down, and you're out, you're out, and you always need some help, you know. And I can really relate to them. That's why I take it real hard. I can't put any money aside. All my money goes to every day, every month. You know, it's no saving. Uh, and if I do save, it's just like putting it up for a minute or two. But you know, when you stay focused on what you have to do and what you got to do, you will make it. You know, it might seem that you can't do it, but believe me, you will come up. Something would happen by the grace of God. Since we last visited with Shirley, she had to leave her job at the AARP, uh, her AARP job at the Salvation Army because her rental income made her ineligible for the program. She has since found a new part-time job as a personal chef. Alfreda, first of all, we all think that's the perfect part-time job, don't we, for Shirley? <laughs> Um, Alfreda, what kinds of savings do working people need to accumulate over a lifetime of working in order to retire? Well, I have to say I, I don't know the answer to that precisely. The, the short answer is save as much as you can, uh, right? Um, and because things are complex, it depends on what kind of lifestyle you want to lead. Uh, it depends on where you're going to live. It depends on if you're going to live with other people. It depends on how old you're going to be when you retire. It depends on so many things. It depends on your situation. So that's, that's why there's no one single answer. So it's important to really find some trusted sources when you're making these decisions. Um, it's not something that you should think about, I'll think about it later. I'll think about it tomorrow. Um, no, it, it, time is on your side, actually, when you're saving. So it's really important to go to some trusted s uh, sources to try to get some good information. Do your homework. You know, dig deep to see what, what, what it's going to take. Because there's nothing worse than as you get close and you realize that you're going to be short. And it's, it might be um, a long retire, you know, a long road because we are all living longer and we have longer, we have to think long term. I think that the most important part of all of this conversation tonight, and one of the things that we talk about in one of our publications of the bank called Building Wealth, is that you really have to sit down and really make a plan about this. I mean, you, it, this all can't be happenstance all the time. These are, these are really important things. 
particularly if you want to leave something behind for your future generations or, or for, for, the, for the greater good um, when you're gone. So it's something that everybody has to sort of take a minute to just sit down and think about, what's my plan? What do I want to do? Where do I, how do I want to, 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 to do this? Where can I get resources? How can I get help? What are the resources out there in which I can make the best decisions I make? Because no one is going to kind of come into your living room and give you all the answers about what you should do. You've got to go out there and figure it out. So there, there is no one answer about many of these things when it comes to financial choices. So do your homework. Andrea, for people who finish working and retire and rely solely on social security income, is that enough? And that's not a trick question? <laughs> <laughs> I think I know what your answer will yeah. be, but explain yeah. why. Yeah, it, it, it's not enough. And it brings up, I think, several dimensions about this, which speaks to the broader responsibility of building retirement savings. I often say that even the, despite the fact that I live and breathe this stuff every day, and I have an MBA, if my retirement savings weren't automatically taken out of my check every two weeks, I would have no retirement savings. And so the first thing is how do we facilitate savings for people so it's much easier? And one of the areas we've learned a ton is about human behavior. And there's a couple of things about retirement where behavioral science has been key. And the first is this idea of opt out. So a lot of companies, when they changed from making people make a intentional decision to save versus setting them up with savings right away and then letting them opt out if they didn't want to, saw the rate of retirement savings increase exponentially. But that's not enough because your point is, who can live on social security? So I get a very significant tax benefit with my retirement savings. You know, I get to deduct it before I pay my taxes. But if you're not in that tax bracket, mm -hmm. what value does that have for you? So basically, the federal government is subsidizing my retirement savings, but they're not subsidizing the retirement savings of the asset poor. Right. Well, that doesn't strike me as fair at all. And so we should be thinking about creating the same structures, direct deposit out of my check in whatever way we can, and provide incentives equal to the value of incentives that middle and upper class people get routinely to help everyone save for retirement. And, and to your point about seniors, there are whole swatches of this city where you'll find little houses that are owned by seniors. And, and, and this house is the only asset, fundamentally. And they fight to hang on to that one asset and they live on limited social security income. And in the context of community, people are cared for. The church plays a role, the neighbors play a role, but there's gotta be a more deliberate policy. We need a plan, but some plans are simpler than others. Mm -hmm. I've got a house and I've got a check. Now what do I do? To your point, there needs to be a better public policy, more thoughtful policy about aging folks who are dealing with both asset poverty and income poverty, because we see it every single day, and it's heroic and tragic all at the same time. When we talk about saving for retirement, if that doesn't sound overwhelming, there are families for whom putting away a month's worth of salary or two months' worth of salary sounds absolutely um, unreachable. Um, do any of you have thoughts on the best ways to help teach people a habit of saving, and then really enable their good intentions to do just that? Well, I'll jump in because um, we've been doing this. Um, we have a, what I, I mentioned, building wealth is something that we've, it's kind of near and dear to our hearts. And this is, it can be, it's complicated or simple depending on how you look at it, but we've sort of boiled this down that if you could just figure out how to what you're spending. So the first thing is, is uh, you take a diary of everything that you spend. And the whole idea there is to know, well, I know how much is coming in, but I don't know how much is going out. And you'd be amazed at how many people just have no idea how much they spend um, in any given point. You just sort of keep going check to check. So we have the basic tenets of, of this, of building wealth, is that you budget to save, 
and then you save to invest. Uh, you control, you build credit, control debt, and then you protect. And so there, it, it sounds almost, well, if it was that easy, well, I weren't, why aren't we all doing it? But it, it, it is in the sense that this is the foundations. And what we're finding is that, and the reason why we came up with this book is that so many people really don't know. It's not something that you necessarily learn at school. Um, it's not something that you're sitting around your dinner table talking about. It's not anything, um, most people really don't want to talk about budgeting when they go anywhere with anybody. <laughs> Let's talk about budgeting. Um, you know, so where are you going to get it? And the point is, you have, to, I mean, if you don't know the, the, the basic foundations, then, then how will it get done? So just starting at that, we have found just starting at that simple, putting something that's simple together that people are not overwhelmed with. Um, it's a free publication. It, it, um, we don't advertise, we don't have, um, we're not selling a product. But it, it's really been very helpful because this is the steps that help people purchase a home, to help people start a business, save for college, start putting away for retirement. There has to be a start. And, and, and sometimes it's just hard to know where to start and, 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 and how to get going. So this is something that you know, we try to, and there are many, many, many sources out there, but it's really important to really know what this thing about financial education, we have to know about the complex decisions that we're making every day, and we have to start somewhere, and we have to share this with our, with our children and our families. We've seen families tonight, Larry, who seem very emotionally resilient, right? And they're eager to get back to work and to take care of themselves. Why is it so much harder to stay financially resilient after even sometimes a single setback or two? I think it relates to many of the things we've said, uh, learning to use products that are available, understanding the process of taking what income you have and managing it the best of your ability. Um, all the factors we've really been discussing. Uh, th through it all, though, this resilience is, is possibly the key to overcoming a fall or a dip into asset poverty. The idea that we mentioned earlier of having hope. And I think sometimes hope comes with a plan. I mean, you're taking some steps to do what you can with what you have. But there needs to be uh, incentives or, uh, to really help you with that plan, like the earned income tax credit, like individual development accounts mm -hmm. that, frankly, Dallas has been very poor and slow to develop. Mm -hmm. And uh, individual development accounts for children who are born in this city would be a novel notion, wouldn't it? What if every child who left the hospital had a, a savings account set up somehow? So, I mean, I think the resilience that you see needs to be complemented, undergirded, and directed. And I would give a shout out to Communities Foundation of Texas again, because they're encouraging those of us who work in this space to begin to adopt collective impact models that bundle training for employment, income development, and coaching so that people really can begin to get traction. And the provider is not going to any longer tolerate a short-term relationship with a neighbor who comes in, but rather they're going to be longer-term kinds of relationships that actually turn into friendships and mutually supportive relationships. One of the things that we see so powerfully is how one or two people in a community can be a role model for others. And the power of that, because um, I was just interviewed about individual development accounts and how um, these are match savings accounts for a very specific goal, buying a home, investing in education, starting or expanding a business. And that paradoxically, many programs had trouble recruiting people because they thought it was too good to be true. <laughs> and so the most effective recruiters were the people from their own community who were doing it, in the same way that the role models we have on this extraordinary series are role models for their communities. And I think a piece of this is really broadening who the advocates are. Mm. Uh, Texas is also very lucky to have a statewide coalition called Raise Texas that brings these issues up to the forefront brings a bunch of tools, but is really focused in on financial counseling. Because we don't think of that, we think of psychological counseling, we think of all these other counselors, but in fact, this is such a critical piece of how we live our lives today, and it should be a service that is as accessible as other kind of things. 
We learned about the Madrid family from the Rockwall County Helping Hands Assistance and Referral Program. Once again, here's Courtney Collins to share their story. Two years ago, Isaac and Elizabeth Madrid were leading a typical middle-class life. Two full-time jobs, a nice house in Rockwall, and a baby on the way. Then serious illness struck and everything changed. Isaac couldn't work, medical bills mounted, and Elizabeth had to shuttle between his hospital bed, a family member's home to drop off the baby, and her full-time administrative job. All my life I've been pretty much healthy. I never really expected, you know, nothing too dramatic or um, life-changing, you know. Um, but as, you know, um, as time progressed, it, it turned into something more serious. Basically what it is, is a blood deficiency. Whenever you make blood, there's eight steps and he's missing one of the steps. You have all these dreams of, you know, you're pregnant and you're like, okay, well, once the baby comes, you know, we're gonna do this as a family, we're gonna do that. All these plans that you had are suddenly just not there anymore and there's no way that you can do them by yourself because, you know, splitting up the time, it was sometimes being at the hospital, sometimes being with my baby. And I mean, I went days without seeing the baby and I think that was, that was hard. My job tried to help me out as much as possible, but couldn't work, so my side of, of the income, you know, came to just a stop. Before everything started, we're, all of our bills depended on two incomes, and that's how everything was planned, and we were fine. And then all of a sudden, here you go, you don't have this one anymore. And it's kind of like, what do you do? I mean, go through the savings, which pretty much that's what we've done, but you know, I guess you just got to take it one day at a time. And other problems, you're eating okay? Um, I have problems with knowledge. Yeah. We're getting you what you need for that? Yes. And you're able to eat a little bit more than you, you were? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah. Just take a big print. Very good. And again? Excellent. And once more. Good. I have to be here, you know, 8.30 in the morning for labs, which, you know, that's what they look for, make sure everything's okay, make sure I don't have an infection, make sure I don't... I'm not running any fevers. Even though we watered things down, he was still really sick for the first transplant. We got him through that just fine and the, the graft just didn't take well. For this transplant, we've actually done a lot more to get him there, so he's, he's been through quite a bit uh, to, to try and get this to work. We've been seeing some progress as far as the transplant goes. Um, but uh, I guess you could say also a little frustrated. Um, that I'm not the end of, you know, of the process. But, I, you know, it just takes time. About a month from the time we do the transplant, maybe a little earlier, we can start sending some blood tests to see how much is donor and how much is recipient. And they can actually quantitate it and break it down by every cell type to tell you how the immune system's coming in, how the bone marrow itself is coming in, and give us a very clear idea of where things are with engraftment. What I would like to have enough energy to actually spend the whole day with my family. And I usually, for the most part, you know, just last about two, three hours before I'm like drained out and I have to go home and rest. Isaac Madrid died on February 13th after his second bone marrow transplant. He leaves behind his wife and a year and a half year old son who shares his dad's smile and his name. Such a hard fight that Isaac gave and now the hard fight is ahead for his wife and his son and Certainly our thoughts are with them and we'll all hold them in our hearts. Yeah. We want to thank our four families for opening their homes to us over the past several months. It isn't easy to talk about debt, unemployment, the state of your bank account, or a serious health crisis. Shanique and J.C. Dory, Natalie Burquist, Shirley Martin, and Isaac and Elizabeth Madrid were honest and brave in their storytelling from the very start. 
Thanks also to our guests, Alfred and Norman, Larry James, and Andrea LeVere, and to our community partners and the Communities Foundation of Texas. For more on KERA's One Crisis Away initiative, visit KERA.org slash One Crisis Away. Once again, I'm Chris Boyd. Thanks for being with us.